I've been testing AMD processors for the better part of three or four years, ever since the first gens even hit the market, and I've just thought to myself, what would it be like to test the Intel parts? They're the performance king, but they come at a hefty price. Well, the 10th gen has just landed, and they're challenging both of those notions, but this 10700K has got a huge challenger, the 3700X from AMD, and today we're gonna be having a head-to-head eight-core matchup, but I've got a little bit of extra data that's gonna be a little different from some of the other reviews you might've watched. So stick around, you might be switching sides. Hey guys, Turk here, hope you're having a great day. Like I said in the intro, we've got the Intel 10th Gen 10700K against the Ryzen 7 3700X, and we're gonna be putting them head to head in a bunch of different workloads. We've got games, we've got applications, we've got synthetics, and we've even got some productivity benchmarks that might help you when it comes to picking components for your next high-end build. So before we get to the benchmarks, let's talk about each of these processors in a little bit more detail. From AMD, we've got the Ryzen 7 3700X. It was released late last year at a retail price of right around 330 bucks. It actually is specced at a TDP of 65 watts, which Intel and AMD, they calculate TDP a little differently. Uh, with eight cores and 16 threads, this boosts up to a clock speed of 4.4 gigahertz with a base clock of 3.6 gigahertz. From a memory side, we get bandwidths all the way up to DDR4 3200 right out of the box, which is excellent, especially when compared to the earlier gen Ryzen processors. And last but not least, it actually has the fourth generation of PCIe baked right in. So if you've got graphics cards or any other types of cards that have that feature, you get that increased bandwidth without it adding any extra cost to your processor. The only downside from this processor is that it does not have an integrated graphics card, so you will definitely need to pick one of those up. But in this battle, we're gonna be having a pretty decent card to begin with, and if you're picking either of these two processors, you're gonna be getting a graphics card. So let's talk about the blue processors really quick. The Intel 10th Gen just landed maybe three or four weeks ago, and this one in particular, the 10700K, had a retail price of right at $400. When you compare that to the 9900K of old, it's actually a significant price drop, which is gonna help it out. From a power perspective, this processor is specced at 125 watts, which is nearly double of what the AMD part is. But again, that's an apples and oranges comparison. With eight cores and 16 threads, this processor actually boosts up to an impressive 5.1 gigahertz and also sports a higher base clock speed of 3.8 gigahertz, which is gonna help it across the board when it comes to our benchmarks today. One of the major downsides for this processor is that it only supports up to DDR4 2933 out of the box, but these memory controllers and these Intel processors are really beefy, so we're actually able to compare these at the same data rates tonight. Lastly, this processor only has access to Gen 3 PCIe, which today is not that big of a deal, but going into the future, it might be a source of contention for anyone that's building a newer PC. With the processors out of the way, let's talk about our test setup. We're gonna be running our Fantex P400 as our chassis. We've done a couple reviews on this one in the channel. We've got our airflow comparison with the P400A upgrade. Definitely check that one out. Uh, but for a motherboard on our AMD system that we've got installed, we're running the Crosshair Hero 7. It's an X470 motherboard from ASUS. It's been upgraded to support the third gen processors. It's got the default UFE options. And the only tweak we did was enabling the XMP profile and down clocking the data rate to 3200. That way you can compare some of these numbers against other news outlets on the internet. For the memory, we're gonna be running 32 gigabytes or four sticks of eight gigs of the Corsair Dominator Platinums. These things are rated for DDR4-3466 and CL16, I believe. Uh, but again, we're down clocking them to 3200 uh, for comparison's sake. For our graphics card, we're rocking the EVGA Hybrid RTX 2080 Super. It's got an integrated AIO with a 120 millimeter radiator in the back uh, to, to balance out the cooling in our system. And for cooling our processor today, we've actually got the Fractal Design S36. We've got the adapters for the newest socket for the Intel processors as well as the AM4 socket. So we're gonna have a direct comparison from a temperature perspective as well as our fan curves will be controlled by the unit. 
For our Intel setup, we actually picked the MSI MAG Z490 Tomahawk. We've had a lot of success with some of the Tomahawks on the AMD side, so I thought this would be a great opportunity to see how it works with the Intel platforms. This is gonna be the LGA 1200 socket, so it's not directly compatible with 30, the Z390 motherboards. But from a feature perspective, this one's got a lot of good stuff. If you wanna see a review of this motherboard, let me know down in the comments and we can take a good look at this. So guys, we got all this cool hardware. It's time to get down to the data. Let's start our analysis off tonight with Firestrike Extreme. And to be honest, all of these results are within the margin of error for both of these parts. The Intel does squeak ahead by a few points here and there, but I think the better comparison is going to be Time Spy. We do see the Ryzen 3700X start to slip quite a bit with the physics score, and that manages to propel the Intel part ahead. We've got some PC mark data as well here, and to be honest, the only really interesting result here is gonna be the digital content creation. We do see the rendering and visualization workloads clearly going in the Intel 10700K's favor, and the Ryzen part just isn't able to keep up. For our gaming benchmarks today, we've got a pretty good variety to cover CPU, GPU, and memory bottlenecked games. For the CPU, we've got Ashes of the Singularity, Escalation, as well as Dawn of War 3 from the Warhammer series. For GPU, Red Dead Redemption 2 is going to be our prime one there, but Shadow of the Tomb Raider is still a really good test for the GPU. For the memory bandwidth game, we're going to be running F1 2017, and then we've even got Grand Theft Auto 5 into the mix. So let's go take a look at that data. The Intel 10700K gets a solid win with Ashes of the Singularity Escalation. At 1080p in the high preset, we see a pretty good advantage going to the Intel part across the different batches that the benchmark provides. But once we engage the crazy preset, the graphics card becomes the limiting factor and we do start to see performance level off. Increasing the resolution up to 1440p, the trend continues, but the deltas are just not as drastic as with 1080p but the 10700K does get the performance win in this regard. F1 2017, at both medium and ultra, and at both of the resolutions we've tested, we see the Intel 10700K perform significantly better than the AMD processor we're comparing against, but all of these frame rates are actually really high, even at the 1440p and ultra setting with the AMD processor, we're above 120 hertz across the board. I don't think the delta we're seeing here is as important as it could be from a numbers perspective, but you know, let me know down in the comments if this is a big factor for you. Warhammer Dawn of War 3, we're only gonna test at the maximum preset. It is a pretty heavy CPU benchmark, but what we observe here is that both of these processors are performing marginally similar at 1440p, and the Intel 10700K only manages to score 30 frames per second better at the average frame rate at 1080p. Just like in F1 2017, our frame rates are really high here, so again, the performance might not be as important to you. Shadow of the Tomb Raider, we're only gonna test the high preset, and we do actually start to see the GPU becoming more of a determining factor for performance rather than the CPU. Both of these processors are great fits for this game, and only at 1440p and high, we start to dip below that 120 hertz adaptive refresh rate. Red Dead Redemption 2 does perform pretty similar to Shadow of the Tomb Raider, but we wanted to test a couple different quality presets as well. We do see the Intel part manage to squeak ahead by a few frames across the board, but that delta is just not that impressive. And as we get up to the prefer quality with 1440p, we are starting to get to that 60 frames per second barrier. So keep, it, keep that in mind when you're picking a computer, especially for longevity. Grand Theft Auto V is gonna wrap us up here with the high preset. At 1080p, the Intel part does manage to get ahead by about 14 frames per second on average. But at these high of frame rates, we're not seeing you know, that improvement delta being as significant as it could be. So both processors perform well, but the edge does go to the Intel. So here's a good test. This is DaVinci Resolve run through the Puget Systems benchmark. And this is gonna be actually looking at the temporal noise reduction with the two better frames option. This is probably the longest test that runs in the DaVinci suite. And we do see some pretty impressive results 
from the Intel part. We do manage to score between five to 10 seconds improvement on all the different workloads, but I gotta say the Ryzen 7 3700X, it does a really good job keeping up with the Intel part here. Cinebench is a fan favorite, and I was actually shocked when I saw these results. The AMD manages to squeak ahead with the Ryzen 15 benchmark, but the Intel manages to score like 50, 60 extra points when it comes to the multi-core score with R20. Neck and neck results is always good, especially for the AMD part since it is about $160 cheaper. Not a lot of people know what Y Cruncher is, but this is a workload where we calculate the number pi. And the results here are in time, so the lower the number, the better. Wait, 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 wait. Turk, Turk. I've seen this data before. It's it's all over the internet. What, 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 okay, 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 guys, I understand. I hear you, I hear you. I'll put the rest of the data towards the end of the video. I won't even narrate it. You can, I'll put timestamps down in the description. You guys can look at it whenever you got time if you all wanna do that. So let's take a look at some fresh data. Let's take a new perspective of things. And this is what's gonna actually turn the tide when it comes to Intel, and that's streaming. Uh, we did a bunch of different tests while running some of the game benchmarks with a whole bunch of different x264 encoding settings and let's just go show you guys why intel is still considered the king of the processors for our streaming benchmarks today we're only going to focus on x264 because that's the encode that happens directly on the processor and in order to expedite our testing we will only be running the slow and medium presets at both the 1080p and 720p scaled resolutions all games will be run at 1080p in either high or medium settings in order to stress the CPU just a little bit more for our gameplay comparison. So let's start off with streaming GTA 5. We do see that the X264 encode is pretty linear and scales really well for both processors, but we do see the Ryzen 7 3700X struggle by between 15 and 25 frames per second, and that's not really good. Both processors struggle when coming to the slow at 1080p transcode, but all of these average frame rates are above 120 frames per second, so both games are pretty enjoyable for the gamer as well as the viewer. So let's take a look at streaming F1 2017. This one also scales very well across the board. We do notice the 10700K sees a slight dip in performance when compared to the native gameplay there in the blue line. But again, the performance is a little bit better on the 10700K. Frame rates are right above 120 hertz, so shouldn't be a problem for the gamer or the viewer. So let's swap on over to a GPU bound benchmark and shadow the Tomb Raider when we're streaming here. The Intel processor doesn't blink and shows very little signs of CPU bottlenecking when we turn on the transcode. But with the 3700X, we see a significant drop in frame rate as we increase both the preset or the output scaled resolution. Again, the slow at 1080p transcode is not a good option here, so steer clear of that one. Red Dead Redemption 2 is much more favorable for both processors, showing no CPU bottlenecking except for the Ryzen 7 3700X at slow and 1080p. We will note that the average frame rate sees a larger dip with the Ryzen processor, but since we're now above the 60 frames per second threshold, it's not going to be as drastic from an output perspective. The, the gamer might see a little bit of performance degradation, but the viewer should. And lastly, how does streaming handle a CPU bound benchmark? Well, Ashes of the Singularity Escalation performs like hot garbage. The viewer is going to yell at you nonstop if you play this on stream, even at the X264 slow at 720p. You know, don't, don't run this game when you're streaming. Well, what do you guys think? Does the 10700K retain the performance crown regardless of the price? Or does the 3700X keep that performance argument on the table and help sway people to go that way? Um, let's talk about both options. The 3700X clearly is the value winner here. It is almost as good across the board as the Intel part. And at $160 cheaper, you can put that money in a lot of different places. The only place you really can't put it is the graphics card. At this performance and budget tier, $160 really isn't gonna get you to that 2080 Super if you had like a 5700 XT, and it's definitely not gonna get you the 1080 Ti or the 2080 Ti. So you can use that money for more RAM, more storage, a better chassis, a better cooler. All are great options when you're building a computer. So from a value perspective, hard to say no to the Ryzen 7 3700X. But the performance crown, still goes with the Intel part here. 
And all of our benchmarks tonight showed that that is the case. But what's more important is the streaming results. We saw instances where the Ryzen 7 just really struggled to keep its frame rates really high. And that just tells me that from a longevity perspective, the Intel cores are gonna have a lot longer lifetimes. It's a stronger core and it also boosts to a faster clock speed. So all of those piled together give you a great single PC streaming setup. And as new graphics cards come out, you know, you're gonna be able to leverage this processor a lot better than I think the Ryzen processor. Again, value option, clearly the Ryzen 7 3700X, but I gotta give the crown today to the 10700K. I'm gonna love playing on it, guys. It's gonna be a good time. So guys, let, let me know if I missed anything down in the comments below. You know, I've got all sorts of other tests we can run. We can run memory scaling tests. We can do all sorts of types of overclocking. We can test this 10700K to its limit. Uh, again, thank you guys for watching the channel. We're gonna have some cooler videos coming in the near future and we'll just have to catch you in the next one. So appreciate you. Have a good one.